Chapter 71 The Death Penalty Exodus chapter 21 verses 12 to 17 He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hands, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbour to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar, that he may die. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. These verses are concerned with several death penalties. Verse 12 has a parallel in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. In biblical law, we do not have the many gradations of murder common to civil legislation today. Unless it is an accidental death, the penalty is death. In verse 13, we have a reference to accidental death. Such incidents were cases where no guilt existed. If, for example, an axe head came loose, flew through the air and killed a man, no guilt was incurred unless a defect in the axe was previously known. A third kind of killing in verse 30 we shall consider later. For accidental deaths, the cities of refuge were created as havens, Numbers chapter 35, verses 11 to 34. The statement, if God deliver him into his hand, verse 13, means if in the providence of God this accident occurs. The first half of verse 14 can be paraphrased thus, if a man slay another in deliberate defiance of law and justice. The premise of the death penalty is the fact that man is created in God's image to be God's dominion man and steward and to take a man's life is therefore an attack against God and his order. For this reason, the right to sanctuary and the cities of refuge were subject to religious review any person who sought sanctuary was given a priestly hearing to determine whether or not he was entitled to sanctuary. Since life and social order are God's creation and ordination, all aspects of murder or killing must be governed by his law. There was thus no unlimited right to sanctuary. Since God is the creator and owner of all things, we cannot take our own life without sin because we are God's property and our life is not our own. Theocratic law excludes our quote-unquote right to do as we please and also the pretended right of other men or civil powers to use us at their will. As George Booth observed, In the first place, no authority was vested by the Mosaic Constitution in any one man or body of men, nor even in the whole nation, to elect a chief magistrate, nor gave any power even to the whole nation to elect a supreme governor. It was the especial prerogative of Jehovah to appoint the title of judge as his own immediate vicegerent. And such men, we know, were from time to time raised up as the exigencies of the state required them and, under a special commission from heaven, wrought the most signal deliverance for their countrymen. Another important consequence of the theocratic polity was that idolatry became not only the transgression of a moral precept of most character, but also an act of treason against the state. 
it was a virtual rejection of the authority of their acknowledged ruler. The law of murder in verse 12 has no qualification. It applies equally to a freeman, a bond servant, and a foreigner. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 to 22. All received light from God and were under his law. In verse 16, we have the death penalty for kidnapping. Given the premise that all men are God's creation and property, to steal a man is to steal from God. The Phoenicians and the Greeks were given in antiquity to kidnapping and selling people. In the ancient world, coastal living, while often necessary for the purpose of trade, was hazardous for this reason. Cities were located at times in terms of safety as well as commerce. Over the centuries, kidnapping for enslavement became very common. In America's slave years, such incidents were often common, especially with very poor immigrants. Thus, in 1791, William Cunningham confessed when dying to the kidnapping of Irish children and the subsequent sale of them in America. Courts ruled against these blonde and blue-eyed slaves when they sought freedom, as in the, quote, celebrated, end quote, case of a German woman, Salome Muller, whom the Supreme Court of Louisiana declared a negress. William Chambers, the encyclopedist, visited the United States in the 1850s and reported on efforts to further enslave whites. Poor whites in the North and South sometimes sold their children into slavery. Others were kidnapped. G. Fitzhugh, author of Sociology for the South on the Failure of Free Society, held Race, do not speak to us of race. We care nothing for breed nor colour. What we contend for is that slavery, whether black or white, is a normal, a proper institution in society. Fitzhugh also wrote, Slavery, white or black, is right and necessary. The Richmond Enquirer held, While it is far more obvious that Negroes should be slaves than whites, for they are only fit to labour and not to direct, yet the principle of slavery is itself right and does not depend on difference of complexion. The light-skinned complexion of many blacks is routinely ascribed to the sexual abuse of black women by their masters. One should not overlook the presence in the slave quarters of kidnapped whites. While some slave owners were Christians who were especially gracious towards their slaves, the driving force in the slave economy was indifference or hostility to Christianity. The selling of girls and women into prostitution was, and is still, a major form of kidnapping. What used to be called the white slave trade attracts less notice today simply because the moral concerns of other eras is lacking. It is still a major form of kidnapping on all continents. God's death penalty covers all forms. Moreover, we should remember that when a nation does not enforce God's laws, God enforces his judgment against them. In verses 15 and 17, we have the death penalty against a physical assault on one's parents and for cursing them. Such laws have existed in many societies whenever the family has been the basic societal unit and central to life and government. Some years ago, a Scottish commentator observed, an old Scottish law made the same offence to be punishable by death without mercy. Yet Canaan and old Scotland are the two famous lands of song, that is, the two happy lands. Perhaps profound reverence for parentage is near akin to godliness, which made a people to be happy. 
This seems horrifying to the modern minds which fails to recognise that biblical law and Scottish law, among others, saw such offences against parents as the ultimate anarchism. The old word anarch means literally no ruler or rulerless. Modern man associates anarchism with a denial of the state as the basic governing power on earth. It seems unreal and remote to him to see the family as central. The laws of Hammurabi were secular, but they still represented an awareness of familistic society. Offences against parents meant the loss of a hand. God's right to legislate over every sphere rests on his property rights as creator. This means that all things are under his law and in the family, parents as well as children. In pagan families given to ancestor worship, no such restraint on parental power exists and parents could do and did sell their children at will. In terms of Exodus chapter 21 verse 16, this would be stealing the child from God. Job clearly stated God's claims on us and his property rights over all. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they contended with me, what then shall I do when God riseth up? And when he visiteth, what shall I answer him? Did not he that made me in the womb make him, and did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of a widow to feel, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless hath not eaten thereof, for from my youth he was brought up with me as with a father, and I have guided her from my mother's womb. If I have seen any perish for want of clothing, or any poor without covering, if his loins have not blessed me, and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate, then let mine arm fall from my shoulder blade, and mine arm be broken from the bone. Job chapter 31 Verses 13 to 22. God's property right over us is seen by Job as the ground for our responsibility towards one another. As against murder, we must manifest love, community, and charity. Murder denies God and His law, our need for community among men and our responsibility to obey God in all things by manifesting his justice and mercy.